Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm going to guide you through this uh, wonderful journey we had at Agen for finding fraud in marketplaces. A uh, quick intro about myself. I joined Agen around three years ago. I'm heading uh, data science there. Before, I had a career in our space for around 10 years. Um, started in Barcelona engineering, and I'm from Mallorca, which I think is relevant given that we are in Germany. Um, if you don't know Agen, just let me just two, two minutes, uh, sorry, one minute to say about something about it. Uh, Agen is, a, is an European company, it's a fintech. We do at the core processing uh, of payments. We also offer financial services, all this uh, API based, everything's digital. Uh, we are all around the world uh, and, and, and we're quite big. Last year we processed uh, more than 500 billion euros through our service and we serve uh, Ubers, uh, Spotify's, uh, Netflix's. Delivery Hero, Flixbus, for example, these companies. And I'm here to talk about uh, machine learning for fraud detection. And when people think about payment processing, they immediately go into transaction risk, which is a setting where you have a well-known seller, say Flixbus, and you have people shopping in, 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 onto them, right? In this setting, it could be you always trust the seller. That's the important bit. And it could be that the shopper is malicious. Say, I don't know, they bought a batch of uh, stolen cards on the deep web, right? So we have algorithms at the gate to make sure that, well, they don't go through, right? We also have an offering for marketplaces. And on this setting, think about eBay. For example, we process all the transactions on eBay. And in this setting, you have another data point, which is um, sellers. But the seller, you don't know that well, right? You do a KYC process, which is everything automated. You gather information like the bank account, like the email, like the passport and then they start processing. And you see this interaction between shoppers and sellers. But in the setting, it could be, you don't need to take for granted that the seller is, uh, is not malicious. So it could be that actually there's some bad people doing uh, selling, right? Um, so we built something for that to help our merchants. We call our customers merchants, merchants because we are B2B. Uh, and we built a thing called Score uh, that uh, has this flow. Uh, just this very high level overview. The idea is that the, the main agent platform is built on Java and Postgres, um, and that's what exposes the endpoints to our customers. And then it's served by a big data platform where we massively use Python to help on the decision making. Right? So in this setting, uh, we could use KYC databases, accounting databases, and we do some sort of online community detection. Think about it as some quick and easy graph uh, algorithm. And then we could also from the big data platform, use algorithms to find weird patterns that could point out to malicious behavior. We send those signals, and then we compute a risk score that our customers can see to see if the sellers are actually uh, malicious or not. On this talk, I'm going to cover this bit, which is the part we do in Python. We use big data a lot, so we're very heavy on Spark uh, over Hadoop. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll guide you through the journey that we did uh, when we try to solve for that. First. I want, to, I want to tempt you with a little quiz. So here's a toy data set, and I want you to think for a moment what you think here is odd. What's an anomaly? Now, most of you actually have seen five and six being very lonely, miserable there, and it's true. They are what they call, what we call uh, local, uh, global outliers, right? Um, the groups at zero and four, they are pretty well behaved. Same shape, same color for everyone there. Um, group number three is weird because it's the same color but different shape, so we cannot say anything. But group number one and number two, you really see there's a data point there that doesn't fit. Right? That's what we call a local anomaly. And that's what we try to find out with those algorithms. We're not trying to find out the global anomalies. We cannot say anything about them. They're just lonely. We're trying to find who is different within their context. So in th these are the anomalies. To do that, I'm going to use an example, which I think is the best way to actually uh, guide you through that. A significant shopper. And what is a significant shopper? Uh, you expect shoppers to have a certain revenue on a seller. If someone actually buys 95% of the sales of a certain seller, that might not be adequate, right? So, yeah. So I think here in the joke, if you buy 10,000 euros, is that a lot? Well, if you buy if you buy in a, a diamond ring, maybe not. But if you go to Febo, maybe yes. And if you're not Dutch, probably you don't know what Febo is. But they are proud of their cuisine, and basically it's this. They serve cold stuff fried from a long time ago. They love it. So yeah, don't, don't spend 10,000 euros on that a month. Um, so anyway, what you really see there immediately is that we can use the average transaction value, which I will shorten for ITV. So 
If it's an override, it's $15. If it's uh, electronics, $500. And the merchant's volume, right? How big is that store? And you can use these two features to say, OK, what's going to be the shopper ratio that I expect for a normal shopper, right? And we're trying to, to do that. And that's what we did. And, and then, like a coyote, we just went there and just hit plans and, and failed miserably until we got it done, right? So the first thing you want to try it out is what basically pumps 95% of the artificial intelligence systems of the world, which are if statements. So you build a rule, and you say, well, a bucket, if it's that ATV, and this ATV, and this volume, and this volume. But that, as you can see already there, that is going to not end well if you want to have some uh, performance, because you need to put a lot of nodes. Uh, for the record, just it's going to be handy later. This basically means that this toy data set, you're going to slice up in different uh, areas through lines, right? Um, what's with rules? Well, if you want some detection performance, you need to put a lot of nodes. And if you put that in production, that's not going to end well. So probably rules are not the best choice. Eh? The detection performance, even with a lot of nodes, is never going to be uh, the best that you can get out without, without the techniques. The good thing about it is that we humans don't trust machines, and we feel good about understanding what they do. So a rule is always understandable. So yeah, it's nice. Regulators love this, for example. right? Anyway, that's not the plan. Let's move forward, try something different. Clustering. Right? The idea with clustering, if you're familiar with those algorithms, k-means or HDB scan, is you basically point, put together all these points that are similar, and the algorithm handles it. Right? What's good and bad about that? Well, what is good is that you can put more features. You're not anymore bound to use ATV and volume, because you can just put more in the matrix, and that will, that will work. Um, why is bad? It's around the boundaries. Uh, maybe, maybe, let me make a metaphor there with uh, the billionaires in space last summer. Uh, if you, I don't know if you followed, but it was a bit ridiculous. They were having this fight about who's going to space, because was one going to 80 kilometers up, and the other was going 100 kilometers up. It doesn't matter. The atmosphere fades out, right? So it's just a convention. So when you have this uh, fading out, it's difficult to establish a boundary. Clustering kind of gets a bit lost there. But moreover, we thought, hang on a second. They didn't ask us to detect uh, clusters. They wanted us to detect anomalies. So this is just like a means to an end. Uh, maybe we're just complicating our lives. So we said, OK, move forward. Next plan. Then we try to say, well, what's better than a rule and is not clustering? A very simple linear system. Um, what is nice about it is that even if you're allergic to equations, you can understand that one. And basically, you have two coefficients, three coefficients, an offset, and one coefficient for the volume, and one for the ATV, and you try to establish a bit where you should be and have a prediction on the ratio, right? So what is good and what is bad about it? The good thing is that, well, uh, it's really explainable, because you can see A and B tells you the, how much you're putting in the decision ink for, for each feature. Good and bad, it depends. If you have borders, linear system is not going to behave well. If you don't have borders, and, and you're bound to have one not polynomial features, then you might get it. But the detection performance wasn't good. So what we tried next was random forests. And random forests are nice. And if you recall the title of the presentation, it was called shallow learning. So the idea is, you might be thinking, random forest is not an unsupervised learning algorithm. It's a supervised learning algorithm. I need labels. What you can do is uh, try to predict the ratio based on the past and do an average, um, a sort of average or shallow learning on the, on the labels. Um, so you want to be very precise on your context. That would be the features like volume and ATV. And you want to be imprecise on your targets, say, the, the, sh the shopper ratio. So you do that. And, and we like that a lot. Um, there's a certain explainability embedded, because you can do uh, feature significance. And you can put more features. Um, we use a Spark, PySpark ML uh, for random forests, which works nicely, for especially for shallow cases. Um, you can embed categories. Uh, if there's boundaries or non-boundaries, you can still do something. Detection performance is actually quite good. And it's fully unsupervised in a way that you can just throw the full data set onto it, and the labels are actually what you observed in the past. Let me give you an example in, for actually production case. This is a real-life significant shopper. We have 800 million rows, uh, 14 input features, one target variable, and we distribute it over Spark, 16 executors, and 36 minutes training time. Of course, this is a visualization that is downsampled because you're not seeing 800 million rows here. Ended up looking like the UK, totally fortunate. Um, and I'm asking here, where are the significant shoppers? So you might say, oh, big bubbles, or maybe people sticking at corners. No, the algorithm finds the stuff uh, all over, right? And this is, the, this is the magic of it. So did we solve the problem? Well, not fully. Um, 
We still need to validate the model, right? We just took a blind guess and we just threw the whole data set into an unsupervised setting and we tried to get a prediction that made sense and manually inspecting everything looks good, but we don't have proof. And what happens if the, the behavior is actually more than one dimension? Because here we have color and shape, but a random forest, you have one target variable, only one. So what can we do about it? And we went into the next plan, which was using, we are data scientists, we like complicating things, so we went into neural networks. And we tried to do the same trick with shallow learning over neural networks. And I know what you're thinking, you say, hang on a second, neural networks, tabular data, doesn't work, right? But it does, because if you're using heavy regularization, it's kind of these cases where you can actually use it. You can look at this paper, which has been recently updated. Uh, it's a great introduction on when, when you can and not use neural networks for tabular data. Very few cases, by the way. We use an architecture you might be familiar called an autoencoder. The idea is that you have a bottleneck that's imposing regularization into the, into the, the data set. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Shall I off and on again? Did you guys see it? Um, thank you for hanging on. Hopefully we fix it soon. I, I asked, they didn't allow me. <laughs> All right. Nope. It was worth a try. I, okay, so so we wait. Okay, so we hang on. All right. Okay, so sorry. Uh, we just try to wait a couple of minutes if they get it fixed. I'm not going to move. I'm not going to do anything. Um, so I was saying, sorry about that, uh, autoencoders, right? So autoencoders is an architecture of a neural network that basically imposes a middle layer that it's, it's reduced, it's a bottleneck, and that basically creates embedding that compress, in a way, the input signal, then you decode it back, right? Uh, because we wanted to have this trick around learning very well our context and learning our behavior on the average, we actually Kind of, we gave a twist on it, and we customized the loss function, and we created a, a scoring uh, equation that could help us find those uh, local anomalies. Uh, we did that with the Keras interface over TensorFlow, and uh, we used well, over Spark and uh, Python. 
Well, did we solve the problem? We haven't yet validated, right? It's still the same problem as before. We just have a, a bit of a leap of faith that the, the model is doing a good job. Um, now we enter into scalability problems because you cannot really use Spice Fark ML to do autoencoders. And uh, if you use tabular data, it might be that you have certain volatility uh, with the gradients on your neural net. Um, we are engineers. We went uh, and tried to solve for this volatility. We used um, ensembles, so we run 16 next at the same time. We average out. And the scalability, we get in there. We experimented with barrier mode on Spark. That could help us by shuffling the weights. But we haven't yet validated the model. So that's something that we did last year. How do you validate unsupervised learning? How do you hypertune uh, uh, supervised, uh, unsupervised learning algorithms? That's a hard question, right? So we created our own test chamber. We, we created a data set that had statistical properties crafted to the things that we wanted to see. And then we tested the algorithms to have a benchmark. Um, we were very happy we did that because we actually found a bug. And, and that bug was around the treatment of our categoricals. So we had to actually change the equations. And yeah, I put the meme there because uh, people asked me whether it was, uh, I, I just put this from Wikipedia just to wow people. It's not, these are true equations. So these are the stuff that is running in production right now. And uh, yeah, maybe you want to see how it works in reality, this thing. Let's do some cases that we have seen through SCORE and how we can help marketplaces find, uh, fight fraud. Um, this is one uh, where we see that the account is very young, that we have seen uh, unusual charge back ratios. Uh, a single shopper did 90% of the volume. That's already quite a hint. Um, low ATV and repetitive amounts. What happened there is people inflating their rating on, as a seller through just little volume themselves. And then they have a great five star score and then scam people. That can happen. That's platform abuse. Another case is account takeover. Uh, basically, they stole your credentials, they changed possibly your bank account, and here we see a change of KYC signal and a sudden change on your behavior, in this case, a spike in sales. Could be, for uh, most cases, fortune is not the case, it could be money laundering, uh, authorization rate, um, prepaid cards. It could be a fraud ring, where we see people actually that are very connected through sharing, say, emails or bank accounts or whatever, and they actually, well, they have uh, little, they don't have shopper variety, or they have refusals and stuff like that. So what is next for us? Did we completely fully solve the problem? No, we didn't. Because if I started, right, on, that was the example case where I started with the uh, sellers and shoppers network, a very simple network. What we did with these uh, algorithms was basically to isolate every seller and look at their surroundings and then find an embedding or find some sort of prediction around it which you can totally see as something like that, as a disconnected network, right? Same thing. But we're losing some power there, right? If you look, go back here, you might say, hang on a second, there was one uh, shopper that was a froster that was connected to a seller that was also a froster. What if they are the same person? And even worse, what about the people that transacted with them, right? So that's why we're, owing, that, that's why we're going full in uh, with graphs. Um, so we're investing hard with that. Um, Ideas that we can also mix up KYC attributes and behavior and have way more prediction power and, and have our algorithms do a better job. And that was my last slide. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's my LinkedIn. If you want to uh, connect, then just shoot a message, say that you've been here, so I don't, you don't try to sell me anything. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, amazing talk. We have some questions online, so I'm going to read them. Uh, I wasn't aware of unsupervised random forest. Which library did you use? Yeah, PySpark. Uh, so PySpark uh, ML. That's nice because it distributes on, the, on all the, the machines that we have. Can you explain what you used as a target in the random forest? As a? Random, uh, as a target in the random forest. Yeah, so what you use is, uh, you have seen in the past the, the ratio of the shoppers, right, in this case. So th that data point in the past is that you would, use, you would try to predict that, right? Uh, just the average, not very, you don't want to overfit, that's the key. Isn't random forest a supervised model? Maybe you meant isolation forest? Random forest is a supervised model, but again, if you, don't, if you use the labels as, I want to predict in the average this, you can treat it as an unsupervised thing. You don't have a label to say that happened, right? 
What graph ML uh, machine learning library are you using? Um, good question. Um, for graph ML, we're going big with PyTorch geometric. Yeah, we like it a lot. Did you try to make the problem a supervised learning by using mechanical torque to create labels or refund and customer support ticket? Yeah. So we do have, in the end, labels coming back from our customers when they say, oh, that actually was a fraud case, this, this, and that. The question, so the problem was, is twofold, right? The first is the cold start problem. When you start putting this thing out, you don't have any, any feedback, so you need to have something there. And the second is, uh, well, they're going to be labeling things that they have seen, and also they have some biases. When you have humans in the loop, they want you know, label things here or there. But what we use it, we use those labels to track performance, right? So if I, we see a detection method that, for example, has a very low, uh, we call it interest rate, so we have a, you know, a thumbs up downflow. So if we see that the detection method has a, has a low interest rate, then we try to iterate on it and see what's going wrong. What happens when a fraud is detec detected? Are you contacting authorities or just sending the information to your customer? No, this score is for customers. So for example, um, if we see that happening on, on GoFundMe, for example, where we pilot it with GoFundMe to, to build this stuff, uh, they could take care of it, is there, is there a problem. All right, thank you. Uh, so I don't have enough time for the rest two of the questions, but uh, you can ask from here. Does anybody have the room in the room have any questions? All right. Yeah, we also have a booth upstairs, and I'll be sitting there, so if you want to just come and chat, that's also fine. It's really hard to understand you. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, maybe, like, why did you use Neo for Neo, like a real graph database? So, like, you have, like, fraud detection. So, like, a classical example for using graph is, like, fraud detection of credit cards or something like this. Yeah. So, yeah, of course. Uh, the thing is that at Agen we have a different philosophy where we just don't jump straight into vendors. We try to see for ourselves. So, what we did, for example, was to um, use what we had, in this case, uh, Spark and graph frames on top of it, try to do certain analysis and see what it would work. Uh, but we think figuring out. So Neo4j would be an option we go for. It might not be. We'll see. Any more questions? Yeah, so the idea is that very is low, right? But, uh, but yeah, but it's not my fraud, right? It's my customer's fraud, so I'm not, yeah. I'm not happy to <laughs> disclose. <laughs> and the yeah. Yeah, but we, we, don't, we don't train on it, right? If you are going there with imbalance. Uh, it's more to say, right, from all these cases, how how many of them were false positive? That's our biggest polluter, right? Uh, and then if we have a big, uh, high false positive ratio is when we try to see, okay, we need to do something better here. Yeah. yeah. Can, you use, can you use, like, some of your cl uh, cross clients' information to help with the validation of frauds? Excellent question. Um, we, at Agent, we're super uh, open and transparent in the way what, how we deal with data, right? And we consider our data to be in the hands of our customers. We just use it for them. So it's, it's an opt-in scenario where they say, yes, we want to check, right? And then you can merge and see uh, what's going on with all the exposure that we have. Think, well, eBay, Wix, GoFundMe, Le Bon Quoi, and all that, right? But we don't push it or we don't do shady stuff with it. All right, one more question. I have a question. So how did you handle um, PAI information like the KYC um, details for the customers, especially when storing yeah. it in the graph database? Yeah, indeed. That's a very, very good question. Um, so fortunately, most of the cases you can just tokenize and stream tokenized data, and then you still do uh, anything around it. Sometimes you miss some prediction power if you don't decompose your feature. Right? Classical example is your email. If you want to extract, extract the domain, for example, of the email. So we take care of that. But we also, I mean, in, in Agent, we iterate a lot. So we build uh, all the stuff uh, uh, all the time. Uh, we also spinning out new flows to train on PI data straight. It just has different requirements for, well, regulation and all that. Thank you for questions, and thank you for the talk. Thank you.